maybe we have a couple of questions, uh, a couple of minutes uh, for questions if, uh, if there are in the rooms before we break for lunch. Uh, is there a micro? Yes. Yes. Well, Friedbert Pflüger from Berlin. Uh, I, I just want to say this was a fascinating debate. Uh, I learned a lot. And my question is to uh, uh, Mariam. Um, we have the COP in front of us, uh, before us. So isn't these, uh, aren't these topics uh, important enough to be placed in the very heart of uh, the COP again agenda? Uh, I, I mean, we, we heard yesterday Mr. Fabius, Monsieur Fabius, talking all the time about renewables, which of course we all know is very important. But the um, potential of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere or store it uh, underground is so tremendous that we perhaps should put a stronger emphasis on CCS and carbon capture use uh, in the COP process. And that would be fantastic if your country could pave the way for that. Of course, thank you so much. And um, as per what I'm aware of within the COP28 team, I do know that carbon is a, a very prominent topic. I think it's going to have the major focus of the conversations which would be driven. Uh, given also the space of business that I'm in, I'm aware that uh, a lot of carbon capture technologies, trades of, of uh, carbon credits and exchanges are going to be coming soon. So I commend the COP28 team ahead of time, but I'm sure we'll all be um, happy and, and satisfied with the results once COP is over uh, in Dubai. So inshallah, more positive news soon. Sorry, if I, additional question. Matt made this uh, suggestion of uh, financing uh, startups uh, in the direct air capture field, for instance. Uh, isn't that also something where, where you should engage? We heard uh, Mrs. Al-Mahiri yesterday saying that you want to put an emphasis on financing tools. So I think this is a wonderful idea of Matt, and if that could be part of the agenda of COP, it would be a tremendous success. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so those are all very exciting uh, solutions. The question is, how do you scale them, and what percentage of the overall problem do you think you could solve, you know, each of you in your different areas, of course? I I can start. Um, so from, from uh, Carpex point of view, we are commercial. So we are operating two projects uh, in Iceland. The third one is about to start next year. Uh, the matter for the technology, it, it's not, um, we are replicating exactly how we're doing things. So it's, it's a matter of uh, in, injection wells. So it's a matter of finding the, the right uh, subsurface, let's say the right geology. Uh, the cost uh, for us is already there, uh, the cost benefit. It's about policy. It's about regulations in each country, in each state. They are different. Uh, I mentioned before, I cannot emphasize uh, timing is something we don't have. We don't have time. Uh, so coming here and educating people about the possibilities, uh, that's the most important. But, but uh, policy is the biggest obstacle, absolutely. Matt, on your view? I would, uh, I would second that notion, but I would also add that really I think project finance is at the core of the scalability issue. It, it provides two functions. First is the project development itself. So figuring out how we can make these projects bankable and scalable independent of what the costs of, uh, the, of the removal is or the product is at this point in time is on the critical path. Because as we scale the technology, even in the earliest stages and highest cost, highest risk of the technology, we are still able to beat the incumbent industrial gas or fuel companies on price parity by pulling CO2 out of the air and making the exact same product. That's, that's without counting carbon credits and things like this. So if we can start banking these projects and scaling it, that will then enable us to start scaling the manufacturability of the facilities. And getting manufacturing up is what we're focusing on right now. 
So our vision is that these machines should be built like cars are built today. And how do we get from here to there? Once we achieve the automobile scale of manufacturing, our analysis is you asked a question about what size of the problem could it solve. Um, if we made enough direct air capture machines that are, that's roughly equivalent to the uh, total number of automobiles manufactured uh, per year today, that would solve 100% of the problem. Now, of course, direct air capture is not going to be 100% of the problem, and there's a question of the solution, and there's a question of energy costs and capital costs and all these things. But if we look at it as, as, as an infrastructural investment, we have to keep in mind that these negative carbon technologies are additive over the lifetime of the project. It's very different than renewables where you, you build a wind or solar plant and it doesn't produce carbon. Every year over the 20, 30 year lifetime of these assets, these are, these are removing carbon dioxide. And so I think we have to take a different approach and a different policy approach to thinking about how we can backstop these financings, how we can provide technology performance guarantees, and how we can provide credit worthy offtake agreements that are bankable. Wonderful. Any other question? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Randy Coty. I'm the head of the regional economic service in the south of France. So I'm also going to adver advertise for my country. We're investing a lot in carbon capturing. So reach out if you want to invest in France. Uh, my question is, uh, Christian, you mentioned $25 per ton. Matt, you mentioned something like 500, 600. Can you give us a ballpark estimate of where the industry is right now in terms of cost per ton captured? And how far down the line can we go on that cost optimization that you mentioned as well? Thank you very much. I, I will start from, so, so we're looking at, uh, I mean, we, we su support one another. So, so, so Matt is, is, is starting by, by catching, I'm taking and then uh, getting rid of it. So together we, we jointly do this. So from the, from the storage part, uh, this is a public uh, paper we, we, have, we have published, so, so there's no, no secrets there. And transparency is of course very important here. So we do have our proprietary capturing technology uh, to capture using water scrubber. Uh, that cost is approximately $20 per ton, but that's using, taking directly from geothermal steam. We transport it and then we inject it into the ground, so the, the rest of the cost is less than, less than $5. But this is a, a scenario in Iceland. So we are working on this uh, large uh, project we call the Coda Terminal, which is uh, 3 million tons will be uh, mineralized every year, transported from mainland Europe to, to Iceland in a liquid form. The cost there will probably be, uh, I would say, around uh, minimum 25 euros per ton. That is just for the storage part. But this is a first of a kind. So by scaling up and by you know, having it closer to the source, the cost will be lower, just like it is in Iceland. The, um, <clears throat> the costs associated with direct air capturing, kind of where we can get to, um, we're well on the target of getting below $100 a ton of, of CO2 captured from the air. But pulling CO2 out of the air, it's like, pardon my, pardon the way I'm speaking, but so what, who cares? That's not useful. The CO2 has to be a liquid or a high-grade liquid or a supercritical fluid. So we have to <coughs> integrate systems in order to get the CO2 to a saleable form or to an injectable form um, and that requires putting more systems together, and that requires additional energy costs and additional capital cost. So when you break down what the overall costs of atmospheric CO2 removal via direct air capture is, today there are some companies that have published results of where they are at, and it typically ranges in the $600 to $800 per ton range. Um, but this cost is heavily dependent upon the cost of energy. So as we scale up manufacturing and, and, and cost down the technology, we see no way with a capital cost contribution of, of the technology over a 10 or 20 year amortized uh, project life cycle can't be in the 20 to 30 to $40 per ton range. And then if you take the energy cost associated with moving, we have to move 3,000 tons of air for every one ton of CO2 that we capture. So if you take the energy cost required to do that, and to convert the CO2 into a saleable product, we can estimate that that's about 1,000 kilowatt hours per ton of CO2. So at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, that's 100 bucks. So we are well within the range 
uh, even at market price uh, power, that's, that's, that's retail price power, to be in the $100 a ton uh, uh, range over time. But that assumes that we take good progression along the learning curve. And so the question becomes, how do we iterate on, on that as rapidly as possible? But I see no technological reason why we can't achieve $100 a ton uh, direct air capture within the next five or 10 years. So we take that as a promise, and uh, I believe uh, with this, uh, with uh, yes, Matt, yeah, it's on stage. So uh, I think will this uh, will will close the panel because it's time for lunch. Uh, we thank you for your attention, and uh, I thank all the panelists and, and and Sam. Thank you for having made the time mm -hmm. very early uh, London time to be with us in Visio, and. Um, Thanks again and have a nice lunch. Yeah. Thank you.